Hello, hello, hello. We are live and I'm having problems with my headphones, but bear with me. Okay, we are live and we are going to do a live mock test um, to help you guys to pass your theory test because I'm still getting comments to say hey, you guys are watching the videos and you're still struggling. So I thought what I'm going to do is a live session every Monday, five o'clock for you guys who are struggling. Um with your mock test, with mock test, with your theory test. And you can ask me any questions as well. So don't be afraid to put comments in there. I can see them. If it's a question, I do ask you to put a cue before it so I can know it's a um, question. I can answer it as um, we go along. So what I'm going to do is... Um, Hi, Black Reaper, hi. Um, thanks for joining. Um, definitely thanks for joining. Let me just make that slightly bigger. Uh, let's see if I can see that. Okay. Right, um, so what I'm gonna do is quickly give a run through um, how the test, fairy test works, because I'm not gonna assume that you guys know how it works. Um, That's my, let me take this swatch off because it's going to start talking through this thing. Um, right, so let me just say a few highs to these people because I know. Um, hi, Paula, thanks for joining. Hi, stopping distances. Um, I'm doing a live mock test. Um, I don't know if stopping distances are going to come up. I will say about stopping distances though, um, they don't ask all the numbers like they used to. I have got a um, stream on my channel which does stop in distances all they do is talk about um double when it's wet which is double and ice and snow um, which is up to 10 times longer so it's not as difficult as it used to be hi right so Thanks for joining guys. Um, I really appreciate that as well. And I thank you guys for supporting the channel because it has grown really quicker than I expected um, as well. So I'm trying to cater for you guys and help you guys as much as possible. And thanks for the comments and coming back to me. Let me know how you guys are getting on with the fairy test. Over the last two, three weeks, a lot of you have passed and a lot of you have let me know that. So I appreciate that because that encourages me to keep and going in terms of um, making more videos. So what I wanna do is quickly run through how the fairy test works. I'm not gonna assume that because I had a session this morning with my class and a lot of people didn't even know it was 50 questions. They just thought it was 100 questions and had an hour to do it. So let me just quickly run through this. It's a multiple choice, 50 questions. You have to, uh, so it's about different categories as well. Um, I've, again, I've got a study with me series. It's got all the categories except two are missing, which will be coming over the next two Thursdays. Um, so I've got to film those and they will be coming over the next two Thursdays, the final categories. So in the study with me series, it will have all 14 categories mm -hmm. where I do a mini mock test of 20 questions. So if you haven't seen that, go and check that out. So it's multiple choice. You have 57 minutes to answer 50 questions. You need 43 questions correct to pass that side of it. My advice to you guys is take the 57 minutes if you need it. Do not rush like I had this morning in my class. One pupil did it in 15 minutes. Guess what the result was? It was a fail on the mock test. Um, just too fast making silly mistakes. So take your time with the questions. It's also, you've got has a perception after that, which is the video clips. Again, on my channel, I've got a method of how to beat the system, two click method. So again, check that out if you are struggling with the has a perception, because on this, it's gonna be just 50 questions, which I'm doing today. At some point during the future, I may do a live um, has a perception as well. Uh, whether it's gonna work on YouTube or not, I don't know, but um, I will try to do a live as a perception at some point, but you guys are mainly struggling with um, the questions and that's my priority is to help you guys pass the has a perception side of things. Um, I will add as well, which came up this morning, 
There's no trick questions. The fairy test is black and white. Safety, safety, safety. It's gonna be safe or it isn't. And the DBSA are looking for the safety option. There is no tricks whatsoever. The question may be worded funny, but that's not down to them trying to trick you. It's just the way they worded it. As instructors, we are trying to campaign for them to reword it, but we've been doing it for years and years and years, and they haven't changed it yet. So don't hold your breath on that. Um, I just mentioned it. It's all about the safety factor. The fairy test is never gonna leave you in a situation where you're unsafe. It's always gonna be black and white. You're gonna be in a safe situation. You're always choosing the safe option. When you go for your driving test, now that's a different story. There's gonna be safety, unsafe, and there's gonna be a gray area with your driving test. You need to change that gray area into the safety zone. But for the fairy test, it's black and white, and it's always gonna be the safest option that you are looking for. And some of the questions are looking for a controlled outcome. So if it's not a safe outcome, it's gonna be a controlled outcome on that as well. And do not overthink it. And also do not make it personal. The theory test is a generic test. It has to be the same for everyone across the country. So don't make it personal to you and do not overthink it. That's the other thing as well. And the other thing that came up today, I've got a video on my channel um, a couple of pupils on the course today said I failed it by one. My view on you failed it by one is not you failed it by one. You got eight, nine, ten questions, whatever you got. So if you got 41 out of 50, you didn't fail it by two, you failed it by eight. You should be aiming for 50 out of 50 and that way if you fall short, you should still be passing. So if you have taken your test and you have failed it by one, stop saying that. You got eight questions wrong or more and watch the video, it explains in a bit more detail on that. So, let me just check the comments to see if there's any questions on there. Um, Ken, oh, someone's tuned in live from Kenya. Wow. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's nice too, I won't see you, but I hear from you. Um, I didn't know I was reaching that far. It's supposed to be a UK fairy test. Let me know in the comments if you're coming to the UK. Is that why you're tuning in? Um, please help me pass. I'm frustrated and I know that feeling. Um, I do my best. That's all I can do. Um, again, let me know in the comments what you're frustrated about other than failing, obviously. Um, if it's any particular questions or any particular categories. Got my fairy test next week. Which, what day next week? Let me know. Um, advice I can give you guys is start revising from day one. I start revising even before mine was booked and it worked out. Got 47 out of 50 and 53 out of 75. Yeah, we've been talking, um, online and your knowledge um to be honest is pretty sharp it's pretty it's really good knowledge and you've retained information so um i know you went to contact me by email as well i haven't seen your email if you've done that but yeah get in touch with me let's have a proper chat um uh, getting 46 out of 50 so far i'm assuming that's mock the other thing i will add about the theory test as well with doing mock tests um let me just explain the app that I use as well. Again, again, I'm getting a lot of comments on about what app am I using. I use the Driving Test Success, which is known as the four in one. That's the one I will always recommend. The DVSA have got one. I'm not knocking it, but for me personally, the DVSA one, the DVSA one, the Driving Test Success one is the one I've used for years and years and years. And I have got good results with those in the, in, with my pupils in the classroom. And also my pupils love it, it's just feedback that I get, they love it. And it's also based on uh, the real test itself. The other thing I will add as well, the questions aren't the real questions. You guys are revising it, going in there, realize it's a different set of questions, or it's worded differently. Once I say different set of questions, it's worded differently. It's sample questions. Anyone that tells you they've got the real questions and know exactly how it's being worded, they're lying to you. I've been an instructor for God knows how many years and I've never seen the real questions. 
I know what questions they're asking there because the feedback that I get from my pupils, I don't know the exact wording, but if you watch my videos, I always say, understand the questions. Because if you understand the question, you understand the answers, you're gonna go in there with a solid knowledge, you're gonna pass anyway. So don't revise the questions as in um, memorizing it. In the UK, Coventry, Midlands, yeah, that's fine. Oh, you got your test on Tuesday. Okay, well, I wish you luck with that. Hopefully this is gonna help you. Um, I'm on again next Monday, so if you wanna attend next Monday, last little cram session, um, and that hopefully that, that may help you. Right, so, has a perception in his mind nightmare. That's the easiest part. Once you know what you're looking for, it's the easiest part, believe it or not. And you're looking for anything that's gonna cause you to slow down, change direction, because technically that click is you checking the mirrors. Um, go and watch the video that I did, not now, watch the live, but go, uh, when it's finished, go and watch the hazard perception video. Trust me, once you know what you're clicking on, it's the easiest part of the test. It's always gonna be the question that's the hardest part. So let me just set this mock test up. Mock test. Hopefully, you guys will be able to see this when it's up. And let me just turn on. Oops. And hopefully, you can see the mouse cursor as well. Right. <clears throat> right. So, doing this live, I will take a look out for any questions you guys have. I know there's a delay from me doing this and on YouTube, so, but if you have got a question about a question that's come, that's come up, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, otherwise, I've still dictated to by 57 minutes because I got 57 minutes to do this. So I'm gonna try to give you a as detailed explanation as I possibly can. But again, I don't know, let me just get centered in this. I don't know what questions are coming up because it is live. Right, so. First question, you're planning to tow a caravan. What will help the handling of the combination? That basically what that is breaking it down is what's gonna help the car tow in the caravan. That's in simple language. What's gonna help the car tow the caravan? And I'll be honest with you, it's a stabilizer bar. The jockey wheel is what you find at the front of a caravan. Power steering fitted to the towing vehicle is not gonna help. A stabilizer fitted to a tow bar is going to help, that's what you're looking for. And anti-lock brakes fit into a towing vehicle is not going to help. Um, so that's the answer to that one. Oh, there we go. Um, vehicle loading, if you watch my video on vehicle loading, this came up um, and a few questions came up in that that I've never seen before. I was totally shocked when that came up, but hopefully I can remember the, the answer with this one. Anyway. What does it mean if your trailer has a maximum authorized mass, known as MAM, of 3,500 kilograms? Your empty trailer weighs 3,005 kg? No. Your trailer and load combined cannot weigh more than 3,005 kg. It's gonna be that, because you're just a new driver. Your trailer can carry a load of 3,005 kg. Um, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. And your trailer and time vehicle combined cannot weigh more. Right, you see now, I'm struggling with this one. I'm gonna to be totally honest with you guys. So I'm in your situation. Um, right, I'll tell you what we do. Let's A, this is gonna be A, that's gonna be B, that's gonna be C, and that's gonna be D. Put in the comments what you think it's gonna be. So A, your empty trailer weighs 3,005. B, your trailer and load combined cannot weigh more than 3,005. Your um, C, your trailer can carry a load of 3,005. Let's say 3,005, 3,500 kg. And your D, your trailer and towing vehicle combined cannot weigh more than 3,005. So let's do this together. Put in the comments, let me know which one you think it is. Because I think it's this one, but I'm gonna change my answer. Um, your trailer and load combined cannot weigh more than five. Your trailer and towing vehicle combined cannot weigh. No, I'm gonna stick with my answer. I think it's this one. I think it's B. 
Let me just check the comments. All right, a lot of <laughs> a lot of you guys are going for B. 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 I think it's B. Um, just the way it's worded, it says your trailer and load cannot weigh. And this one, where I thought it was, I was going to change my answer to is trailer and towing vehicle. The towing vehicle is a car. The car's going to weigh more than 3,005, so I think it's B. So we'll clock that at the end. Right, you're following a large vehicle as it approaches a crossroads. What should you do? Should. The key word there is should. Um, when it's got should in the question, it's related to the question. It's something that you should be doing. Driver signals to turn left. Right. So let me just read that again. You're following a large vehicle as it approaches a crossroad. What should you do to vehicle signals to turn left? Right. Wait for the driver to cancel the signal. That's going to be no. Overtake if there's no on the coming vehicles. No. Wait for the vehicle to finish turning. That's a possible. And overtake if you can leave plenty of room. No. A large vehicle, in other words, a lorry, will have to swing out to get around the corner because their reference points of turn is different from a car driver. Still getting the Bs. Still Bs, Bs, Bs. I think it's B. What we'll find at the end. I love this. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. Um, all right. So, what, again, should you do if there's a bus at a bus stop ahead of you. So again, related to the question, what should you do? Watch carefully for sudden appearance of pedestrians. That's what you should do. So I'll tick that. Continue at the same speed, but sound your horn. That can't be safe if you're gonna go at the same speed. And you don't need to sound your horn. Um, flash your lights to warn the driver of your presence. That makes no sense. And pass the bus as quickly as possible. That's no different from continuing at the same speed, to be honest. So safety, and then again, what should you do? It's gonna be that one. You should always look out for pedestrians um, when there's a bus pulled up at a bus stop. There are objects hanging from your interior mirror. What could this, why? See, that's my dyslexia kicking in. Why could this be a hazard? Um, obstruction, your view, that's the back in the day with the old fuzzy dices, for those of you old enough to remember that. Um, your view could be obstructed, it's gonna be that one, but always read the following answers just in case, because sometimes they give you a bit more detail and it's a law that comes into it, which means that's gonna be the correct answer. So always read the following answers. Your sun visor might get tangled, no. Your windscreen could mist up more easily, no. And your radio reception may be affected, definitely not. So it's gonna be that one. <laughs> Again, should. Um, why should you use your mirrors when you see a hazard ahead? All right, let's see what option they give us. Technically, you're checking the mirrors to see what's to wear. I explained to my pupils, if it, if the eye don't see the problem, it can't tell your brain what to do next. But um, that's for driving lessons. Let's see what they do with the theory side of it. Because you need to accelerate out of danger, which makes no sense. Um, to assess how your actions will affect the traffic behind, yes because if you don't see the problem, you don't know if you need to slow down a lot earlier. Because you will need to break sharply. Once you've got sharp in the answer, it's not even worth reading, let that go. Um, to check what's happening on the road ahead. You check in the mirror, so you don't need to be checking the mirror to see what's happening on the road ahead. So it's gonna be that one in terms of logical answer. Okay, let me just check on the comments and see what you guys are saying on that. <laughs> um, right, what what do you need before you can legally use a motor vehicle on the road? So what do you need before you can legally use a motor vehicle on the road? An appropriate driver license. Um, that's a possible. And you need a driver license for your category. If you guys didn't know, you, when you go for your driving test, you're doing a category B, which is a car test. A vehicle handbook, no. Breakdown cover, no. Proof of identity, no. It's going to be a driver's license to make sure you're legally allowed to drive the vehicle you are learning in. 
what information is found in a vehicle registration document. That's, of, um, that's also known as a V5. Sometimes they would as a V5, V5C document or a vehicle registration document. And it's gonna be the registered keeper of the vehicle. The date of the MLT, no. The service history details, no. The registered keeper. And just in case you didn't know, it's gonna be the registered keeper, not to the owner of the vehicle. The owner could be the finance company. It's the person that's keeping the vehicle um, that's gonna be on there. And the type of insurance cover, no. Sorry again, let me just check on the comments. Can't just see that clearly, but you guys are still putting A's and B's. Well done. I like this. Okay. Um, what well, again, should, let me just put that down a bit. Right, should, what should you do when you're using a contraflow system? Now, if you don't know what a contraflow system is, a contraflow is when you're going, for driving, you're going against the flow of traffic. So the traffic's going up. It's normally a bus going down, but this I'm assuming it's related to a motorway. So you're going against the flow of traffic. That's what contraflow means in terms of driving. So let's see what they're giving us as answers. Um, what should you do when you're using a contraflow system? Increase speed to get through the contraflow more quickly. Once you increase in your speed, it can't be safe. Remember, it's all about the safety option. So you can let that go. Follow other, mot follow other motorists closely to avoid long queues. Again, driving too close can't be safe. So those two could be gone. Choose an appropriate lane in good time. That's possible and switch lanes to make better progress and that you shouldn't be doing switching lanes or stay left when possible. So out of all the options, it's gonna be this one. Choose your lane in good time with a contraflow. <sighs> Again, should, every time, should, 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 should. Right, what should you do before starting a journey in foggy weather? If it's foggy, you wanna either clean the windscreen or leave more time for your journey. That's the two options they could normally give you with a foggy question. And it's got a line, allow more time. So that's gonna be that one. Have a caffeinated drink. In other words, drinking coffee, no. Wear a high visibility jacket, no. Reduce your tire pressure, no. In fog, allow more time because you're gonna be driving slower or you should be driving slower because obviously it's harder to see. You've just gone through flood water. This is also known as a Ford. So if you see Ford on your questions, that's what they're talking about. Ford is just a lot of surface water. And again, what should you do to make sure your brakes are working properly? It's just test them. Before you speed off, just test your brakes before speeding off. Go slowly while gently applying the brakes, yes. Avoid using the brakes at all for a few miles. Obviously you can't do that. Accelerate and keep to a high speed. Again, you're accelerating, so forget that. Stop for at least an hour to allow time, to allow them to dry again, no. Yeah, when you go through a lot of surface water, just test your brakes before picking up speed to see if your car is slowing down. If it's not slowing down, then you need to pull over and let them dry out. You wish to turn right, so you are turning right. Why should? you take up the correct position in good time. To help other road users know what you intend to do, yes. Your car's position is also like body language. Certain body language, you can tell what people are thinking and feeling. Um, with a car, by positioning your car to the right, you're letting people know you're gonna be turning right. If you're staying to the left, you're letting people know you're either turning left or going straight. So that's the reason why you wanna be doing it especially for those of you that's gonna be doing driving lessons later on. So you take up your position nice and early so the car behind knows exactly what you intend to do. To allow other drivers to pull out in front of you, no. To give a better view into the road that you're joining, no. To allow drivers to pass you on the right-hand side, no. Why is it dangerous to travel too close to the vehicle ahead? Your sat-nav will be confused, no. Your engine will overheat, no. Your view of the road ahead will be restricted, possible. Your mirrors will need adjusted, no. And that's how the fair test works sometimes. If you read the answers to this question, these questions make no sense. Oops. 
These answers, sorry, not questions, these answers makes no sense. And sometimes the fairy test throws in some stupid answers. But you guys need to stay calm enough to work way through it. When you go for a test, you stress out and panic. And when you panic, you can't think clearly. So if you realize these three are stupid answers, so technically by default, that's the correct answer. So you can't really go wrong on this one. Okay, let me just check in on the comments. Okay, you guys are guessing the right answers on this. Well done. Oh, you look having a conversation. <laughs> well, um, no, Paul, I'm saying to drive on the road, you'll technically need a driving license. Tax insurance or MOT if needed. Um, you need a driver's license first. I'll tell you how that works, um, Paula. First of all, you need a driver's license. And then once you've got a driver's license, that says you can take driving lessons. Then it's going to be MOT next to say, when you get your car, you need an MOT for that car to make sure your car is roadworthy. Then you need insurance to say you can drive the car on the road. And then you're going to need tax to tax your car on the road. So it's MOT for driver's license first. Then when you get your car, it's MOT to make sure it's roadworthy. Insurance to say you can drive your car on the road. And then tax to say you can tax your car to be on the road. Um, again, should what should you do when you're overtaking a horse and rider? Go past as quickly as possible. No, because you'll spook the horse if you go too quickly. Sand your horn again, you're going to spook the horse. Go past slowly and carefully, yes. And flash your headlights as a warning, no. Again, technically these three are stupid answers. So again, you're left automatically by default um, the correct answer on that. I don't expect you to pick, and like I said, your knowledge is pretty strong, so I don't expect you to panic at all. That'd be a shock if you did, to be honest. Um, why is traveling in neutral for a long distance, known as coasting, bad driving technique? Um, that's with the clutch driving down, it's a lack of control. Um, for those of you who've taken driving lessons, you do not want your clutch to be down when going around corners or for a long period of time, if you're in second gear or higher. If you're in first gear, you can do what you want with the clutch, but in second gear, you need the clutch fully up. Um, it will make the engine stall. You can't stall with the clutch down. It will cause the car to skid. No, it won't. Um, there won't be any engine braking. That's the correct answer. The, this plates, I won't go into too much detail because the theory side of it, um, but I have got a video on the channel talking about coasting as well you need your clutch plate to be up so it's going to be that one there won't be no engine brake and all there's lack of control that can weather it back way as well the engine will run faster technically yes the engine will run faster but that's the answer they're looking for and there we go that's the question we had before ford um a previous question with the flood of water so why should you test your brakes after this hazard so that's the flood of water your brakes will be wet possible you'll have you'll have you'll have just crossed a long bridge no you'll be going down a long hill no you'll be on a slippery road no so your brakes are going to be wet and that's going to be the answer with that one what will affect your vehicle stopping distance so what will affect your vehicle stopping distance the street lighting time of day, the condition of the tyres or speed limit? The answer for this one is going to be the condition of your tyres. Um, and if you didn't know, it's a legal requirement to keep your tyres 1.6 millimetre tread depth um, or higher. Once it gets below 1.6, it's illegal. It's also three points on your licence if you get caught with a bald tyre. Speed limit does not affect your stopping distance. the right answer before going on. Let me just move this down a bit. Okay, right. You're driving with your front fog light switched on. What should you do if the fog has cleared? Um, switch them off. Fog's gone. Don't need them anymore. Um, switch them off as long as the vis visibility remains good. Yeah. Leave them on if other drivers have their lights on. No. Drive with them on instead of headlights. No. And flash them to warn oncoming 
traffic, but it's foggy. It's going to be that one. If the fog is lifted, just turn your fog lights off. Simple as that. Don't need them anymore. Some of the theory test questions rely on common sense, such as the one which the fog stop and distance. Yes, totally agree with you. It's common sense. But when you're in a nervous situation, sometimes the common sense goes out the window. And I'll be honest with you. Um, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I see that in the classroom a lot, especially on the driving test. Common sense goes out the window. People do something really silly on a driving test. Um, you arrive at an incident. A pedestrian is bleeding heavily from a leg wound. The leg isn't broken and there's nothing in the wound. How can how could you help? Dab the wound to stop the bleeding. Dab the wound. No. Keep the casualty's legs flat on the ground. No. You're going to raise it, to be honest, to stop the... Um, try to stem the blood flow. So you're going to raise the leg above the heart. Give them a warm drink. You should never give anyone a warm drink at a scene of an accident. Um food or drink at an accident and the reason for that foods if there needs an operation gas and food don't mix so you're never going to give anyone food or drink at an accident apply firm pressure over the wound is what you're going to want ideally you want to tie something tight around the wound um, and then raise the leg or arm if it was an arm above the heart so the heart doesn't pump down it pumps up which is harder to do because you're just trying to stem the blood flow I'm just keeping an eye on the comments. Right, oh, keeps moving. Um, a collision has just happened. An injured person is lying in a busy road. What's the first thing you should do? Again, first thing you should do. So treat the person for shock, no. Make sure the injured person is kept warm possible um place them in a recovery position place them in a recovery position what are they recovering from a collision has just happened the injured person is lying they're just lying in the road so no and warn other traffic it's going to be the safest option is going to warn other traffic that's the first thing you should do because it's a busy road so warn other traffic first to keep yourself safe if you're going to help out Right, you've broken down on the two-way road. You have a warning triangle. At least how far from your vehicle should you place the warning triangle? Now with this, I always say, look at the images first before go looking for the answer. Um, a warning triangle needs to be placed 45 meters away. Again, I was checking the comments on that. You guys are going for D. I'm assuming D was from the last question because it's not D on this one. I know there's a delay, delay with me doing this and YouTube receiving it. Um, it's 45 minutes to replace your triangle, but you never place a triangle on the motorway, by the way. So if the question comes up, you never place a triangle on a motorway. So 45 meters away. Um, don't need to read the rest because it's not going to be even close to that. So it's 45 meters away from a broken down car. What's the speed limit for a car towing a trailer on the motorway? Right, I want you guys to, I know you guys are putting in the comments A, D. So like I said, there's a delay. I'm going to wait a little while. So I want you guys to answer this one. What's the speed limit for a car towing a trailer on the motorway? So a car towing a trailer on the motorway, what's the speed limit? A, 60. B, 70. C, 40. D, 50. So let me see what you guys put in the comments. I've got an A, A, oh. Adam, Adam R. Am I saying that right, Adam R. Banks? You got B. A. And A. 
Right, the correct answer. There you go, he's given a full answer. The correct answer is 60 miles an hour. It's gonna be A. Um, the easiest way to remember this is know what you can do as a car driver. That's the way I explain it in a classroom. So I always get my pupils to know what they can do. They can do 70 miles an hour on a dual carriageway or a motorway. And then when the question is asked about towing um, vehicle or heavy goods vehicle, you just automatically drop it by 10. Know what you can do. So I repeat that, or you can do 70 miles an hour as a car driver. So drop it by 10 for a towing vehicle. If it's on a single carriageway, you can do 60 and then obviously drop it by 10 for a towing vehicle, heavy goods, it becomes 50 miles an hour. So well done for you guys who thought A. Let me make sure I can tick it before I can move on. When should you use the left-hand lane of a motorway? Right, when you're making... <laughs> When you're making a phone call, that's what I'm talking about, a stupid answer. Um, obviously not, because you shouldn't be making a phone call and driving at the same time. Um, when the road ahead is clear, that's a possible. When you're overtaking the slower traffic in other lanes. When you're overtaking slower traffic in other lanes, that's undertaking, which is technically illegal, so you shouldn't be doing that. And when your vehicle breaks down, again, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, it's going to be when the road's clear. When the road is clear, you should be staying left. Always stay left when possible or stay left unless you are overtaking. And when you overtake, get back to the left for safety reasons. How should... Your position, well, how should you position yourself when you use the emergency telephone in the motorway? All right, let's, you guys do this then. Um, answer this one in the comments. So let me just repeat the question. How should you position yourself when you use the emergency telephone in the motorway? Because not many people know this. Stand on the hard shoulder, A. Face the oncoming traffic, B. Stay close to the carriageway, C. Um, keep your back to the traffic, D. So put in the comments, A, B, C, or D. Got B's. B. And you've got B's. Right, the answer is going to be B, face oncoming traffic. The reason why you're gonna face oncoming traffic is so if a car loses control, you can see it, so you can run, basically. Never turn your back on the traffic on the motorway, face it. And then once you finish, put the receiver back and then get behind the barrier or the grass verge for safety reasons. So I just wanna check something. There's a question that came up here and I just wanna... There we go. Paul has asked a question. When can you undertake? Um, Right, <laughs> good question. Motorway wise, when you're going, when the traffic in the other lanes are going slower, then you can do it legally. So if the traffic's going slower in the middle lane, the right hand lane, for example, you can pass on the left um, just because that's legal, they're going slower. If it's a general question, um, which they can ask in the ferry test, when can you legally overtake? It's a one way street. Um, is the answer because traffic is all going in the same direction. So you on a one-way street, you can pass left, middle or right. It makes no difference. But on a motorway, the only time you can legally under, undertake is when the traffic is going slower than you are in the left-hand lane, if that makes any sense. Okay. Which vehicle is most likely to take an unusual course at a roundabout? It's going to be a large vehicle um, because they have to swing out to get round the corners. So, a uh, milk float knows cost as a car, so you take the same route, a meter away from the curb, a state car, a meter from the curb, delivery van, a meter from the curb. It's gonna be your long vehicle because they need to swing out for that one. When are you allowed to park in a parking bay for disabled drivers? When are you allowed to park in a parking bay for disabled drivers? Not ever, unless you've got a disabled badge. 
Um, when you have advanced driver certificate, no. When you have a blue badge, yes. When you have a wheel wheelchair, no. And when you have an adapted vehicle, so it's, no, it's going to be a blue badge. If you've got a blue badge, then obviously you can park up in a disabled spot. It's not going to be an issue. No problem, you're welcome. Who has priority and unmarked crossroads? Again, all right, let's do this one. This comes up a lot and people get confused. So you guys put A, B, C, D in the comments. Read the question again. Who has priority at an unmarked crossroads? The smaller vehicle, no one has priority. The larger vehicle or the faster vehicle. What I should do is A, B, C, D, sorry. A, smaller vehicle. B, no one has priority. C, the larger vehicle. D, the faster vehicle. Right, I've got, so I've got these. <laughs> Paula's changed her mind, she gave me a C. And she's giving me a B. So you change your minds, okay. B. Okay, and that's what you want to do. You change your mind. If you're not sure, you can always change your mind. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. It's going to be B. No one has priority. If it's unmarked, you've got to go with caution or be careful with that. No one has priority on that. So well done for those guys who put B on that. <laughs> All right, we just discussed this. Let's see if you guys are listening. Um, what's the speed limit for a car towing a caravan on a dual carriageway? So we're talking about dual carriageway now. The last one was a motorway. So what's the speed limit for a car towing a caravan on a dual carriageway? A, 70 miles an hour. B, 60 miles an hour. C, 50 miles an hour. D, 40 miles an hour. So let me take a look in the comments and see what you guys are putting. B, got B's. Right, so speed limit for a car towing a caravan on the dual carriageway. Remember, dual carriage was like a motorway, so you can do 70 and they're going to do 10 miles an hour less, so it's 60 miles an hour. So well done to you guys putting 60 miles an hour. You put C. It's a dual carriageway, it's 60 miles an hour. 50 would be a single carriageway. So be careful with your carriageways on that. Again, some of you are going for C. You fall into the trap of a dual carriageway and motorway. Remember, motorway and dual carriageway are the same thing. So don't fall into that trap. A single carriageway, obviously they're gonna go 50 miles an hour. A dual carriageway, I repeat that. A dual carriageway, motorway is the same thing. Don't get confused by it. Powered vehicles used by disabled people are small and can be hard to see. What must they display if they're traveling on a dual carriageway? Okay, this came up this morning in the classroom. Again, you guys put the answer. A, flashing red beacon. B, flashing amber beacon. C, flashing blue beacon. D, flashing green beacon. Again, let me see what you guys are coming up with. Got a B. B. Any advances on Bs? B and got a full explanation. 
flashing amber like every other slow vehicle such as high wave maintenance. Right, let me just explain the colors. Flashing red doesn't exist. Flashing amber beacon is slow moving. So anything that's slow moving is gonna be amber. That's your dust carts, recycling vans, AARAC, when they are towing the vehicles. The disabled buggies will be slow moving, so it's gonna be your AM amber. Flashing blue, that's your emergency services. Now, if they ask you the question about which one will be using the flashing blue and they don't give you your obvious, obvious ones, that's your fire engines, police cars, ambulances, you want to work out which one of them saves a human life. Flashing blue only relates to human life saving. So the common one they use outside of the obvious ones, the two, is uh, life, lifeguards and bomb disposal units. That's the two you're looking for outside of the obvious fire engine police cars. And your flashing green is your doctors, not paramedics. I will add that it's not paramedics, it's your doctors. That's what it comes down to. But flashing amber is a slow moving, slow moving. So for those of you who's ticked B, that's what you're after. Okay, let's do this one as well. Again, this came up this morning. Why should these road markings be kept clear? So A, to allow children to be dropped off at school. B, to allow children to be picked up after school. C, to allow children to see and be seen when they're crossing the road. And D, to allow teachers to park. So let me see what you guys have got in the comments. I'm assuming these Bs are for the previous question. And like I said, I know there's, there's a delay. Right. Okay, so I've got a couple of Cs. Right, for those of you who've gone for C, it is C. Children should be able to be seen and um, be seen clearly, to see and to be seen clearly. That's what it's there for. It's not for um, parents to be dropping off their kids, even though they do. It's for children to be seen um, and see the road clearly to cross safely. Right, what should you do if you want to turn left at a junction where pedestrians have started to cross? Um... Right, safety option. Stop and wave them across the road, no. Once you wave somebody in your driving test, by the way, it's over, the exams are gonna fail you for that. Um, go around them and leave them plenty of room, that can't be safe. Give way to them, yes. And plus the new highway code rules that come in last year, I think it was, you've got to give way to pedestrians looking to cross and sound your horn and proceed, no. The safety option is always gonna be allow them to um, cross the road or finish crossing the road. What should you do when you're approaching this crossing? So again, um, look at the image before go looking for the answers. So speed up and pass quickly, A. Prepare to slow down and stop, B. Continue unless the pedestrians step out, C. Stop and wave pedestrians across, D. Let's see what you guys are going for on this one. Again, I think I'm still getting some seeds from the previous question. Right, so now I'm getting the comment through right B. D. And B. So you guys, the majority of you guys are going for B. So it is prepared to slow down and stop. That's the safest option. That's where you want to look at. Um, slow down and stop. It's going to be that one. So well done to you guys for getting that. Ah, all right. Let's see what you guys know about this. How much? More fuel will you use by driving at 17 miles an hour compared with driving at 50 miles an hour? 
So let me just read that again. How much more fuel will you use by driving at 17 miles an hour compared with driving at 15 miles an hour? A, 15%. B, 100%. C, 5%. D, 75%. In the last three or four months, they've updated this as well. So let's see how good your knowledge is. I'm just checking the comments on that. I've got this question, I'm not test. I think it's A. Okay, you think it's A? A. A. All right, the majority of you are going for A. And all of you are wrong. It's actually... I'm joking. It's A. Um, it was 30% about four or five months ago. It's now 15%. So if you're doing apps, it obviously been updated. If you're doing books, be careful. That's the advantage of using apps because the apps get updated automatically. So the answer is 15%. So well done. How can you reduce the chances of your car being broken into when leaving it unattended? So park near a taxi rank, park near a fire station, place any valuables on the floor or take all valuables with you. So which one do you think is the safest one out of all of that? I'm just waiting for them to come through. Like I said, there's a, there's a delay between YouTube and me doing this. Callers making me laugh. I've got D. I've got D. And I've got a full explanation. It's going to be D, but it could also be C if you can't take the stuff with you. Um, what is C? Place any valuables on the floor? No, it wouldn't. If you can't take your valuables with you, lock it in a boot. Or glove box, depending on how big it is. Don't leave it on the floor. Because um, people still look through and see, still see stuff on the floor. So if you can't take your valuables with you, um, lock it in a glove box or boot where it's out of sight completely. So yeah, it's going to be D in terms of that. Right, what does it mean if your vehicle keeps bouncing after sharply pressing down a release and release on the bodywork of a wheel? Um, with this one, um, it's your shock absorbers are worn out. Um, shock absorbers are just massive springs either, um, just near the wheels on each part of the car so if it bounces your shock absorbers are worn out that's what that one is um, vehicles on soft ground no the shock absorbers are worn yes it's going to be that one the tyres are under inflated if the tyres are flat basically what they're saying it wouldn't bounce anyway and the tyres are worn which is no Um, how can you reduce the damage your vehicle causes to the environment? So how can you reduce the damage your vehicle causes to the environment? Um, use narrow, narrow side streets. Makes no sense. Use, use busy routes. Again, that makes no sense. Anticipate well ahead. For those of you that's going to be taking driving lessons, we, as instructors, we call it awareness and planning. If you plan well ahead, you're going to anticipate. So your braking is not going to be sharp and the amount of gas that you use is not going to be sharp as well. So it's going to be this one. Why have red routes been introduced to major, in major cities? So why have red routes been introduced in major cities? Um, to help traffic flow. Technically, red routes, you should not park on there. So it just helps traffic flow. Um, to, to provide better parking, no. To raise speed limits, no. To help traffic flow or to help the traffic flow. 
Yes. To allow lorries to load more freely. No. Right, I'm just conscious of the time here. We've got 13 minutes and got 12 questions to go through. Um, so I want to complete this. Um, you're invited to a pub lunch. What should you do if you know that you'll have to drive in the evening? Eat a hot meal with alcoholic drinks. Eat a hot meal with your alcoholic drinks. If you're driving, you shouldn't be drinking full stop. Um, have some milk before <laughs> drinking alcohol. Again, you've got alcohol. Don't drink any alcohol at all, which is going to be the safest option. It is possible to have a few drinks as well and be under the limit, but my advice to you guys, especially as new drivers, get your license, don't drink, full stop. If you're going to drink, let someone else drive or take a cab. Avoid mixing your alcoholic drinks. It's going to be a bad one. What should you do about driving if you've been... Oh, my dyslexia is kicking in. Mm -hmm. Right. What should you do? What should you do about driving if you're being taken medicine that causes drowsiness? Got it out in the end. Um, avoid driving and check with your doctor. Uh, possible. Only drive if your journey is necessary. No. Ask someone to come with you. No. Drive on quiet roads. Yeah, some medications make you drowsy, so double check with your doctor or read the side effects on the leaflet. You've been involved in an argument that's made you feel angry. What should you do before starting your journey? Um, and that's more to do with road rage. So calm down, which is an obvious one. Turn on your radio. No. Have an <laughs> alcoholic drink. No. And open the window. No. It's going to be calm down before starting your journey. Just don't take your anger out on other road users. I'm just checking the comments. Yes, red routes are commonplace like London. That's why it's so damn hard to drive down there. Um, what should you do if your traffic in the left-hand lane is slowing down? So again, look at the image. So you've got lane closed off on the right-hand side and the left-hand lane's open. So just read the question again. Should is involved in that. What should you do if the traffic in the left-hand lane is slowing? Accelerate past the vehicle. Once you've got accelerate, it's pointless reading that on. Pull up in the left hand, pull up on the left hand verge. No. Slow down, keeping a safe separation distance. And the keyword there is going to be safe. Oops, I can't draw straight. It's going to be safe. And move across and continue in the right hand lane. You can't continue in the right hand lane because the right hand lane is closed off. So it's going to be this one. What should you do if a doctor prescribes drugs that are likely to affect your driving? So that's similar to the question we had about a couple of questions back. Um, just word it slightly different. Again, that's how the theory test works. And that's why it's important that you understand the question. So no matter how they throw it up to you, you're going to know what the answer is. Right. Oops. Get that back down. Right. Read the question again. What should you do if a doctor prescribes drugs that are likely to affect your driving? Avoid driving on motorways. No only drive if someone is with you, no. Get someone else to drive. It's going to be the safest option because you're not driving. And never drive at more than 30 miles an hour. Yes, they have Yulees. It's called Yulees. Um, I think it's about £12.50, similar to the congestion charge on that. That's for older vehicles, by the way. I don't get charged Yulees when I go down there. But if you've got an older vehicle like a diesel then you're going to get charged driving in London. This is a contraflow. So we had a contraflow question before. So let me just explain what a contraflow is. Again, you're going against the flow of traffic. So if you look here, the barriers have been opened. You're going on the wrong side. So you're going up. There'll be cones along here and then traffic's coming down this way. So the question, what does this side mean? Contraflow system, which I just gave you the answer is contraflow. Um, one way street, no. Change to the left hand lane. Change to the left hand lane, no. Leave at the next exit, no. It's a contra flow. You're going against the flow of traffic. This keeps moving. Oh, 
what does this line across the entrance to a roundabout? So they're talking about this dotted line here. Um, that's pretty easy. If you're driving, you know what that, you should know what that means. It's roundabouts, what do you do? Give way to your right. It's literally give way to your right. So stop at the line, no, because it's not solid. If it was solid um, line, it would be a stop line. You have the right of way, which you don't on a roundabout. Traffic from the left has the right of way. Traffic from your left has right of way. No, it doesn't. And give way to traffic from the right. So roundabouts, you give way, and that's what that means. Um, what does this sign mean? Route for buses only, that's not a bus sign, so you can rule that out. Parking for buses only, again, not a bus sign, rule that out. Parking for trams, that is a tram. So you could tick it as a possible. And then the last one, route for trams only. Um, it's gonna be route for trams. It's not parking for trams, but it's gonna be that one. And as I said, you can always change your answer. So it's not a problem with that. So I'm just checking the comments to make sure I haven't missed any questions. Oh, keeps moving. Right, back. Right, how will a police officer in a patrol vehicle signal for you to stop? Pull alongside you, use the siren and wave you to stop. Um, no, pull alongside you is going to be dangerous. Gonna, they're going to be in the middle of the road. Flash the headlights, indicate left and point to the left. Yes. Use the siren, overtake, cut you in front and cut in front and stop. No. And overtake and give a slowing down arm signal. And again, the answer is no. It's going to be B. They'd always stay behind you, flash their lights and point to the left to indicate it's you they are after. Obviously, if you decide not to stop, that's a different story altogether. You're in a tunnel when you see this sign, what does it mean? Um, beware of pedestrians, no footpath ahead, no. Beware of pedestrians crossing ahead, no. Direction to the emergency, pedestrian exit, yes. And no access for pedestrian, no. They can show you a phone symbol and it'd be the nearest direction to the nearest phone as well. But in this case, it's emergency exit. Um, in a tunnel, you don't want to be stuck in a tunnel. Get out, get fresh air. Don't stay in the tunnel with car fumes. And then you've got the videos, um, which is called your case study. We're not going to do the videos, but it says, why is it dangerous to overtake near a junction? Um, the reason why it's dangerous to overtake is a driver waiting to merge might not see you. A driver waiting to merge. Emerging is coming out, so that's a possible. You'll be in the blind spot of a driver waiting to emerge. No. You signal, your signal would be hard to see. No. The road surface would be slippery. Yeah, if you overtake in over near a junction, a driver waiting to merge might not see you, so that's what it's going to be. And what's the speed limit on this road? Let me just show you on this one. It's a single carriageway. You guys give me an answer to this one. What's the speed limit on this road for a car towing a caravan? It's a single carriageway. So what's the speed limit? A, put this back up, A, 50 miles an hour, B, 30 miles an hour, D, 40 miles an hour, D, 60 miles an hour. Got A's coming up. Right, it's going to be 50 miles an hour. Remember, you can do 60 miles an hour on a single carriageway and drop it by 10, it becomes 50 miles an hour. Right, let's get this up. Um, what do the white diagonal stripe markings in the middle of the road mean? And um, they're talking about these, these are called hatchet markings. I call them tram lines, but they're hatchet markings. Um, technically, you can't go in there unless it's necessary. So you should not enter the area unless it's necessary and you can see it's safe. Again, safety is the key word there. No overtaking. 
You must not enter the area unless it's an emergency. No, and it's overtake. It's an overtaking area for motorcycles. No, it's going to be this one. So that's the last question. And there you have it, a full house. So hopefully you guys got some benefit from that. And like I said, I'm going to do that every single Monday. It was nice actually getting you guys picking your answers. Um, I wasn't thinking about doing that. But yeah, thank you for joining in and contributing. Um, have you guys got any questions? If you have, put it in the comments because I'm willing to stay on and answer your questions even if it's driving related let me know as well i can help you if you've got a driving lesson or you're struggling with your driving as well in i know that because i remember from what you said before i have never driven a car in my life you've not had a driving lesson yet the other thing as well when you with the theory side of it, some of you guys are literally doing the theory first and no driving lessons. There's no harm in doing it side by side because obviously it's going to reinforce your learning because you're driving, so you're going to practice your theory side of it. So you're going to put it into practice. So don't be afraid to take driving lessons while you're taking the theory test. And also sometimes by the time you finish your driving, it's not finished your driving lesson, by the time you pass your theory, you could be ready for your driving test. You literally pass your theory and go off and book your driving test. The waiting time for a driving test now, depending on where you live, could be anything from two to six months. So there's no harm in starting to get your driving now. Yes, it's always good to keep up your knowledge because you need it for your driving, full stop. Whether you pass your driving test or not, it's good to keep your knowledge up to date. Remember, when you pass your driving test, if you didn't know, you're on two years probation if you get six points or more on your license in the um, first two years, you lose your license and you're back to square one. And then you've got to do the whole theory test and driving test again. Take a few driving lessons. Don't be afraid to go out and find an instructor and take a few driving lessons. It's going to help your knowledge. Have Paula, have you got a theory test book? So I can't remember if you put in the comments when we started. Have you got a theory test book? So are you just still studying? Let me know. Have you guys got any other questions? Let me know in the comments. I just want to wait for Paula to respond. See if she's got a theory test booked. Are you guys struggling with any particular category? Then I can do a video for that particular category. As much as I've got a study with me series, if you guys are struggling with any particular categories, let me know. I'm quite happy to film a video and release that. No problem. Thanks for um, joining. Um, and hopefully your fairy test goes well when you take it next week. Paula, no. What are you waiting for? There's And again, there's no harm in booking a fairy test be realistic if you think you're going to be ready for in two weeks' time. Book one for two weeks. You've got a goal. You can study and study and study and never take it. You can contact me by email. Um, info at thinktosuccess.co.uk or Instagram. Send me a message. I'm trying to get better with my Instagram, answering the messages on there. Or comment on one of the videos i'll pick it up in the comments at some point i will i'm trying again i'm trying to get better with the comments there's so many of them now um so i will try to um get to the comments but your best bet if you want to contact me is email info at think to success.co.uk okay i'm gonna leave it there because no more questions are coming in i want to thank each and every one of you for turning up it was actually enjoyable um i'm doing it again next monday so again, if you guys want to join me, Mondays, five o'clock, I'm here to help you, as many of you, all of you as possible, pass your theory test. Um, if you have got one this week, 
I wish you luck with it. I've got my fingers crossed for you. Always let me know how you get on pass or fail. Let me know how you get on in the comments. And if you do need help, like I said, let me know in the comment section of the videos or um, sorry, just read the comments. Sorry, or let me know via email or Instagram. If you look in the descriptions in the videos there, if you scroll to the bottom, it's got the, it's got the old Instagram, which is Think to Success, but it's now, that would still come through to me if you use the old Instagram Think to Success, but it's Driving Theory UK. And if you scroll to the bottom of the description, my email is in there. So it's, like I said, it's info at Think to Success. Or if you um, go onto the website, which is gonna be updated soon, but I still think it's live. And again, dub, 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 um, dot think to success dot co dot uk Josephine I wish you the best of luck with that let me know how you get on um, take your time make sure when you're going there you breathe and think it through um I'm waiting for my provisional license to come through. I sent off for a replacement a week ago. Okay, yeah, you're gonna need a license for a theory test. Um, you can still book one, because all you need is the driver's number. If you've got a copy of the driver's number, that's not gonna change. When you get your license, it'd be a, the serial number will change, but not the driver's number. That will always remain the same with you. So you can still book one, but yes, yeah, set a goal. Um, two weeks, three weeks from now, And you are welcome. <laughs> he, he's gonna wanna be driving soon, very soon. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. And I hopefully will catch you in one of the videos. If not, back here next Monday at 5 p.m. And I really appreciate your guys' involvement. It made it really, really enjoyable, time flew by. So thank you for that. And I'll catch you in the next video.